So we're going to talk about Robert Field Stockton. He was a man of, he was above all a Jerseyman. So at the end of the presentation, we're going to see where that term came from. Now, as a teacher, every lesson was supposed to have a goal, which is we're going to learn about Robert Stockton, and then you had individual aims for that lesson. So what are we going to be looking at today? Well, some of the things that were important during Robert Stockton's time was the question of slavery, the divergent political parties that came into existence, manifest destiny, the naval expansion, the technological and scientific innovations during his time, and the growth of capitalism. So during the presentation, I hope that uh, I'll be able to cover these items and at the end we'll see how that affected his life. All right, we start off with his birth, August 20th, 1795. He was born to Richard, the Duke Stockton, and his wife, Mary Field. So Mary was from Bordentown. Robert had eight siblings. He had four brothers and four sisters. And there's our Morgan that uh, he was born in. His education, at eight years of age, he was sent up to Basking Ridge, New Jersey, to the Basking Ridge Classical School, run by the Reverend, whoop, excuse me, uh, the Reverend Robert Finley. Later on, he's, Finley's going to play an important part because when we talk about the American Colonization Society, Finley was the founder. The interesting thing is, at eight years of age, Robert got kicked out of the <laughs> Basking Ridge School for fighting. So maybe that's where he got his first nickname, Fighting Bob, from. He then went to the Princeton Academy. And this school was interesting in that there were no, they advertised, no vacations, no normal holidays unless the parent writes a letter and says, you want your child uh, to be home for that day. At 13, he goes to the College of New Jersey. At 15, he dropped out and joined the United States Navy. And again, there's a picture of the school that he first went to in Basking Ridge. On September 11th, or September 1st, 1811, the 16-year-old Robert gets a warrant as a midshipman in the United States Navy. His maternal uncle, Andrew uh, Hunter, who had married uh, his father's sister, Mary. Mary and uh, Susanna Stockton were twins. So uh, Andrew Hunter married one of his father's twin sisters. And he taught, he had been teaching at the uh, College of New Jersey. He was in math and astronomy, and he was a chaplain and in the Navy, and he ran a naval school at the uh, Naval Yard in Washington. So uh, Stockton becomes a midshipman. He reports in February of 1812. On June 18th, the United States goes to war with Britain. The War of 1812 started. Now, Robert in the War of 1812 had a very interesting career. Uh, if we go back to that real quick, on uh, June 18th, right after the war was declared, uh, he sees his first combat when uh, his, the ship he's on attacks a British ship called the HMS Belvedere. And uh, Robert is sent up to the mast, top of the mast, with 20 men. <laughs> Their job was to have muskets and fire down on the enemy's ships. And if they boarded the ship, then they would give cover and fire. So uh, that was his first introduction into naval warfare. We move on to August of 1814 when the British captured uh, Washington, D.C. Here's a picture of them burning Washington. Uh, Robert was there with uh, Commodore Rogers. They were on an uh, intelligence mission, and eventually they make their way to, uh, to Baltimore. And in the defense of Baltimore is where Robert gets his nickname, the uh, Fighting Bob, because he does much in the area of leading American forces in the defense. There is a number of battles outside of Baltimore, a place called North Point, and Rogers Bastion, where he's leading the sailors in land warfare. Uh, he helps sink ships in front of Fort William McHenry to keep the British from going there and he is a messenger running back and forth uh, carrying out Commodore Stockton, or Commodore Rogers' orders. Uh, the British on September 15th gave up trying to take 
uh, Baltimore and left the Chesapeake. Now, Fighting Bob, uh, sobriquet, I like to use the French term instead of the nickname, I think it's <laughs> last name. Right? Uh, so he was, that's when he really was started being called Fighting Bob. And at 19 years of age, because of his uh, bravery, he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant. And he was given leave at Christmas to come home, and one of the things was because he had a wound in his hand. His next uh, adventure in the Navy is the Second War with the Barbary Pirates. On May, 15, uh, May 9th, 1815, he's assigned to the USS Spitfire as a part of Stephen Decatur's squadron. In uh, the New Day, the DEY, that was the head of the uh, Algiers, and he declared war on the United States, but because we were involved in 1812, because we were involved in a war with uh, Britain, the United States couldn't do anything to stop him. Finally, when the war ended, they sent a squadron under Decatur to uh, take care of what was going on in the Mediterranean. Again, uh, Robert Field leads a number of raids. He captures a Algerian ship and uh, he exhibits a number of bravery. One of the sad things that happened during his time in the uh, Mediterranean, his younger brother, Horatio, who was two years younger, he also joined the Navy, was a midshipman on Decatur's ship. He ended up dying. Uh, they're not sure whether he had a wound or he died of some disease, but his uh, younger brother died in the Mediterranean. Now, while on station in the Mediterranean, Robert fights three duels. Now, remember, the Commodore, the head of the fleet, is Stephen Decatur, and he is known to have said, any man who made arms his profession could not decline an invitation to duel from any person socially or professionally of his rank. And who did he duel against? His first duel was in 1817 against a British naval officer who wrote an insulting comment against the United States Navy. The second duel took place the same year in Gibraltar against a British officer. In both of these duels, he wounded the one in Naples in the leg and the second duel, I think it was in the arm. Uh, if you read about the second duel on Gibraltar, again, this is like a uh, adventure novel where uh, the commander of the fleet uh, wasn't Decatur at this time. He was against dueling, the head of the British in Gibraltar threatened to arrest anybody who had a duel, but uh, Stockton sneaks on to Gibraltar, he has the duel, he has to escape, and like I said, it's an adventure now. The third duel was against a midshipman on his own ship. Uh, Stockton heard this young man complaining that if he and Stockton were of the same rank, he wouldn't dare treat me the way he did because I challenged him to duel. So Stockton said, all right, I'll waive our differences and we'll have a duel. In this one, Stockton just uh, fired his gun in the air and then it was settled. Remember, it, it, this is a matter of honor. You don't really have to go on to really shoot and kill somebody. However, the sad thing is in 1827, his older brother, Richard, was killed in a duel in New Orleans. His older brother had left New Jersey, went to Mississippi, became a very prominent lawyer in Mississippi. He was on the Mississippi Supreme Court, but matter of honor when he was in New Orleans and he had to, he fought a duel and was killed. So his younger brother Horatio died in the Mediterranean, his older brother Richard, so remember I said there were four boys, or he had four brothers, two of the brothers had died by 1827. And basically because Richard dies, this is why he inherits uh, Mormon. Mm. His first command, 1821, was on this ship, the USS Alligator. And his orders were to sail off the coast of Africa and intercept any vessel, any American flag vessels, remember, remember that, American flag vessels engaged in the slave trade. Because even though slavery was legal in the United States, starting in 1807 and a series of laws, it became illegal to import slaves from Africa. So the U.S. Navy sent ships off the coast of Africa to uh, stop the importation of slaves. Now, uh, one of the Commodore's heroes was Lord Nelson of uh, Trafalgar fame. And one of the things uh, Lord Nelson did, he wrote in his book about creative disobedience, that it, 
you have orders, but if you don't follow them exact, as long as it comes out good in the end, it's all right. <laughs> so uh, Stockton believed in creative disobedience. The first ship he stops is a French flagship, Le Jeune uh, Jeune. So this was a French ship that he believed was carrying slaves. After he stopped it and took it up, took over, they found one slave aboard the ship. The next one in October of the same year was a Portuguese flagship, the Mariana Flores. Now again, he thought there was some craziness with this ship. It refused to identify itself, and uh, Stockton said the ship fired on him, so they fired back and took it. However, both of these cases, he took the ships back to the United States as prizes. In both cases, they went to federal court. The owners of the ship sued him, uh, saying he has no right to take us because we're, you know, foreign flag ships. In the first case, it's interesting, Daniel Webster, we're all familiar with Daniel Webster, he was his attorney. He defended uh, the common, well, the lieutenant in this case. And in both cases, he was vindicated. So we're going to see a start of a long series of times when he's accused of things and uh, he's not found responsible. His third uh, voyage on the alligator to Africa leads to the founding of the country of Liberia. Uh, in your handout, later on, uh, when we're done, there's a page about the American Colonization Society. And uh, we're going into a lot more detail. But basically, they sponsored this trip. So even though he's in the United States Navy, the American Con uh, Colonization Society had a great deal of pull, and basically he was sent there to survey where could we set up a colony for free slaves. However, he goes beyond his civil uh, disobedience or creative disobedience, and he takes over land at this uh, Cape Mezzarudo, and uh, it eventually becomes the town city of Monrovia, and eventually became Liberia. And by 1860, different accounts, they have different numbers of number of blacks who immigrated to Liberia, who declared its independence in 1847. And as I said, at the end, we can go over more about the American Colonization Society. His final voyage on the alligator. He was in Charleston, and he gets orders, go to the West Indies and protect American ships from pirates. Well, he runs into problems again because he had strict orders, don't go into foreign waters. Well, he follows pirates into the Cuban waters and attacks these ships. And he's ordered back to Charleston. That was, and he's relieved of the command. A little side story. Five months after he was removed as commander of the Alligator, the new commander ran the ship on a reef in the Florida Straits and they had to scuttle the ship. So I guess the new commander wasn't as a good seaman as our Commodore. Now he's on the beach, he's in Charleston, South Carolina, where he meets Harriet Marie Potter, the daughter of a very wealthy merchant landowner, John Potter. And if you go into the Pollard, you'll see this picture of Harriet Marie. They were married on March the 4th, 20, 1823. In 1824, the couple moved back to Princeton, but in 1826, he's ordered back to the south to uh, survey naval facilities in Charleston and in Savannah, Georgia, that area. 1828, he was given leave to come back north for his father's funeral. And for the next 10 years, he's in the Navy, but he's on furlough and leave. He had, he had no active duty for a 10 year period. And as I said, the portrait down in the uh, parlor, Thomas Sully is part of the Morgan collection. Lieutenant Stockton and his bride moved back to Princeton. The Palmer House was Robert and his family's residence from 1824 to 1837. His father, John, gave them that house as a wedding present. And Robert and Harriet had nine children, three boys, Richard, John, and Robert Jr. Six girls, Catherine, Mary, Harriet, Julia, Caroline, and Anna. If you know anything about the genealogy of the Stockton family, <laughs> all the kids have the right same there. name. Uh, the other interesting thing is Robert Jr. is the third son. So the first son was named Richard, like most Stocktons. The second son was named John, but uh, Robert Jr. was the third son. When Robert's family 
moved into Mormon after his mother Mary's death. So she had life tenancy. So Mary and uh, some of her, a couple of the, I think, unmarried daughters, they lived there. Uh, so he didn't move into Mormon until after his mother died. And the interesting thing is after uh, he moved into Mormon, he sold Palmer House to his brother-in-law, James Potter. So his father-in-law gave him the house, but he ends up selling it to his brother. <laughs> and Palmer House today is the guest house of Princeton University. So if you happen to be a guest of Princeton, they invited you there for something. They'll put you up at the Palmer House, which is right around the corner from here. Okay, Robert Stockton returns to the South as a sugar cane, cane plantation owner. Mm. From 1828 to 1830, he owns a sugar plantation in Brunswick, Georgia, the Sea Isles. Uh, the sugar plant, planting of sugar cane on the East Coast just came into vogue during this period of time. A man, man named Stan, Samuel Spaulding wrote a book about the scientific growth of sugar cane. And Robert, as one of the things I mentioned about scientific and technology, he corresponded with uh, Spalding about how the best way to raise sugar cane. And as I have down there, it's interesting, you know, he was trying to stop uh, slave trade from coming, you know, bringing slaves into America. When he owned the sugar plantation, he owned over 100 slaves working it. And the sugar cane becomes his first failed business venture. What happened was the United States government took the tariff off of sugar cane, so sugar cane came flooding in from the Caribbean, and so locally grown sugar cane, the prices dropped and he ended up uh, selling the plantation. So he ends up moving back to Jersey. And this is where he gets into the transportation business. So we're gonna talk about the coming of the Delaware, Raritan Canal, and the Camden Amboy Railroad. The Stockton family and friends advocated a privately financed canal across uh, the same area of central Jersey. Uh, basically, his father, the Duke, had originally uh, got to ask the New Jersey legislature to build a canal across central Jersey, but at public expense, New Jersey said no. So he, he comes back with the idea, let's have a privately financed canal. At the same time, the Stevens family from Hoboken, they were advocates of having a railroad across central Jersey. Now, initially they were antagonistic uh, be, over the Stevens and Stockton factions and their political allies, but they came to an agreement to approve both the Canal and Railroad because they came to the conclusion that they're gonna uh, have different clients, that the railroad is gonna mainly have passengers and light freight, and the canal is gonna carry the heavy uh, loads. So that's why they came to an agreement. In 1830, the New Jersey legislature chartered the Camden and Amboy Railroad. And they sold their stock out. One, the legislature said each one has to come up with a million dollars worth of stock. And they sold their stock out in 10 minutes. The Delaware Railroad and Canal was not very popular. Uh, they had a year to sell a million dollars worth of stock. Eventually, uh, Robert borrows $500,000 from his father-in-law and buys up the remaining stock, so he becomes a majority owner of the stock in the canal. Now, let's talk a little bit about the canal. The canal opened on June 25th, 1834. The picture up there is, if you're on Princeton uh, Pike and you turn off on Quaker Bridge Road before you come to the shopping centers, there's the, lock, the canal keeper's lockout and it's called Port Mercer. Canvas White, who worked on the Erie Canal, was the chief engineer. I thought he had a very interesting name, Canvas White. <laughs> the canal workforce consisted of approximately 4,000 Irish immigrants. They earned a dollar a day for a 12-hour day, and if you wanted to earn extra money for every stump you took out, you could get 25 cents. And one of the things you read about, uh, hundreds of these workers died of cholera. Uh, I forget where it was, you might jump in here, might know where the mass grave is. Well, they're, they're grave in a different town. Right. It was 1832 to call it. The total cost of the canal in those days was 2300000 The canal went from Delaware to the Raritan Rivers, 43 miles in length, and along with the two feeder canals, it was approximately uh, 65. As the crow flies from the Delaware to the Raritan, it would have only been 28 miles, but 
you know, they can't follow a straight through. The main cargo on the canal was called from Northeast Pennsylvania. In 1866, 83% of their freight was uh, anthracite coal. In 1873, the canal had its peak revenue. That's the year it made its most money. 1893, it was running out of deficit. 1933, the canal ceases operation. 1934, the canal property is taken over by the state of New Jersey. And in 1974, 60 miles of the Delaware Raritan Canal becomes uh, New Jersey State Park. So. If you're on your way out of Princeton, you'll cross the canal. That's all part of our uh, state park. Now, in February of 1838, the New Jersey legislature married the canal and the railroad, and it became known as the Joint Company. So here's a map of the railroad. So the red line is the original Camden Amboy Railroad, and it went from Camden to basically South Amboy. Next to it is the New Jersey Railroad. It started out as the Philadelphia Train Railroad, uh, and it follows the route today that New Jersey Transit takes Amtrak, the Northeast Guard. And eventually, uh, again, that became part of the whole thing. Here's the, the canals thing starting up here. These are the feeder canals from Bordentown to Trenton, and then Trenton, then all the way up to there. So these were some things about the canal. Alright, let's jump ahead a little bit. 1838, remember, he's still in the Navy. You know, he's running, building canals, what have you. In 1838, he's appointed, uh, he's made a captain in the United States Navy, and he's assigned to the USS Ohio in the Mediterranean. He's the executive officer. However, he gets his politician friends to get him uh, to go to England to bring dispatches to the American Council there. So he's not actually on a ship. But while he's in England, he meets John Erickson. He was a Swedish uh, designer of ships. And it was Erickson who came up with the idea of a propeller-driven steamship. And uh, Robert was very intrigued about this. And he buys this ship that was designed and built by uh, Erickson. And Erickson, it was called the Robert F. Stockton. And it was the first iron steam propelled driven ship to cross the Atlantic. It was only 70 feet long, 10 foot beam. And when it came to the United States, it was renamed in New Jersey. And for 30 years, it was used as a tugboat on the canal. And the reason that the Commodore wanted this type of ship was because he felt, being it was an iron ship, when you know, the canal started to freeze a little bit in the wintertime, it could go through like wooden ships couldn't, or boats. And also because of the propeller. You know, the original ship, uh, steamships had the side wheel or the back wheel. This also would be good in cold weather. So this ship uh, was the first one that they bought. Now, aside from fighting Bob, he's also Stockton, the naval engineer. Captain Stockton, along with John Erickson, are selected to build a steam propeller-driven warship. Construction, as it says there, began in October of 1843 and in 1844 at the Philadelphia shipyard. When it was launched, it first went to New York, and there was a British ship there. It was supposed to be the fastest ship in, the, in Britain. It was called the Great Western. Well, they raced around New York Harbor, and the ship, the Princeton, beat it. In February of 1844, it arrived in Washington and hosted two parties. The first one, which I didn't even realize, was February 20th, and the second one on the 28th. In case you're interested, about the Princeton, it was 170 feet long, 30.6 beam. That means how wide it was, 17 foot draft. That means how much water it needed. It was, as you see from the picture, it was both sail and steam. Its innovation was it had a 16 foot six blade propeller located underwater, and the engine was below the water line, and it ran on anthracite caulk. Again, you remember you see pictures of steamboats on the Mississippi, they're chopping wood, things like this. This ran on anthracite coal, so these were some of the innovations. Okay, we're all familiar from our tours of Morgan about the disaster. So an explosion aboard the Princeton kills 8, 20 injured. Among those killed were the Secretary of State Upshaw, the Secretary of the Navy, 
John Tyler's future father-in-law, a man named uh, Gardner, uh, he got killed and the President Tyler, who was a widower, consoled his daughter and they ended up getting married. And the other interesting thing was one of uh, a, a valet to President Tyler, a slave named Armistead, was also killed. President Tyler was going to watch this demonstration, but he got delayed below deck, so he did not uh, end up being hurt. Now, what caused the explosion? Two raw iron cannons, the Oregon and the Peacemaker, were their main armament, and we all talked about how the Peacemaker blew up. And if you want to see the Oregon's, its gun, and the Peacemaker, the second, are located at Annapolis and uh, Washington Navy Yard. So this was the cannon that blew up. The Peacemaker was designed by the Commodore, the Oregon, that cannon was designed by uh, Ericsson. And it happened to be the Commodore's uh, cannon that blew up. Now there was a board of inquiry, Tyler, the President, Congress, board of inquiry, they found that uh, no individual was responsible for it. It was an accident. Now, there's the bell from the USS Princeton. And if you walk next door to the Battle Monument, right behind the monument is the bell. So you can take a walk over in nice weather to see the uh, U.S. Princeton. Now what happened to the U.S. Princeton? The Commodore took it on a mission that he went to Texas in 1845. Uh, it, and it was sent to the Mediterranean. And in 1849, it needed to be overhauled, but it cost too much, so they scrapped it. So it was only in service for uh, less than five years. Now, here's a little interesting sidelight to the Commodore's career. So after the accident in uh, Washington, Princeton goes back to uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard for repairs. Now, at the same time they're there, uh, these anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic riots are taking place in Philadelphia, in the Kensington section where the Philadelphia Navy Yard is. Having spent 30 years with the school district of Philadelphia, I always assumed the Navy Yard was always where it was. Mm -hmm. In South Philly, where the Schuylkill, no. During this period of time, it was like basically where the Ben Franklin Bridge is, uh, that part of Philadelphia, Kensington. So that's where the riots first started. Uh, and the local authorities, the state militia, they really could control what was going on. And Captain Stockton, he volunteers his crew for service. And he offers a hundred heavily armed boarders that they would, they were told, you know, stop this riot any way you can. Now, one of the reasons that the rioters kept going on, because they knew the local authorities, the sheriff's department and the militia, they weren't going to fire on their friends. Uh, Stockton offered these men, and these what, were what the borders looked like. <laughs> so if you're out causing trouble, and a hundred of these guys walking shoulder to shoulder with their lances pointed at you, carrying guns and cutlasses, uh, I think you would stop doing a little bit of rioting also. And again, this is from a picture uh, from the time. So, and the interesting thing is the Know Nothings eventually become the American Party, and in 1856, Stockton tries to run as president, as the head of the party. Okay, now we're moving on, where he gets his first title of a Commodore under President James Polk. Secretary Bancroft and Polk, they give him an assignment. Take the Congress annex Texas. They agreed to take Texas in the Union. And he was given the job to bring the message to the Texans. While he's in Galveston, he has a little bit of co covert operations going on. He meets with the head of the Texas militia, and he offers, basically out of his own pocket, to arm and outfit a militia to uh, take over the disputed boundary between Texas and Mexico. Uh, the Mexicans said the Texas boundary was the Nueces River, and the Americans said no, it was the Rio Grande. If it was the Nueces, which was further north, half of uh, New Mexico and Texas would not have been part of what we know as Texas today. However, this Texas legislature said, no, we're going to negotiate, and Stockton is ordered back to uh, Washington. And, you know, Paul kind of knew what he was doing, but he couldn't officially uh, encourage him. Now, in August of 1845, he is ordered to go to the Pacific Ocean aboard the USS Congress. And uh, what I have up there, much to his dismay, because Stockton felt the war is going to, there's a war going to break out between Mexico 
and the fighting's gonna take place in the Gulf of Mexico, and one of the things the commodore craved was glory, and he felt he was being cheated uh, from fighting the war in, uh, against Mexico. But he leaves Norfolk on October 25th, 1845, and this is the ship that he sailed around the Horn on, the USS Congress. This was his flagship. The, a little interesting side light, in 1862, the USS Congress was sunk by the ironclad of Virginia, uh, Virginia, or as we more commonly call it, the Merrimack. All right, Commodore's first mission in the Pacific, his job is to drop the U.S. Commissioner to the Sandwich Islands off on his folks. So Hawaii was originally called the Sandwich Islands. He dropped anchor in Honolulu Bay June 9th. So remember, he left Norfolk on October 25th, June 9th of, in 46. That's when the ship lands in Honolulu. While there, he mediates a dispute between the American Commission and the Hawaiian government. They had a uh, falling out. And he also gives a sermon where the king of Hawaii was present. And the king of Hawaii at the time was King Kamehameha III. And there's a, you can get it on in the biography, uh, uh, in the handout, in the uh, bibliography, there's a thing online you can read, a sketch of the life of Commodore Robert Stockton written by a uh, Samuel Bayard and Stockton himself, where they give details about this, where this sermon that he gave in the church, the king was so pleased with it that he uh, congratulated the Commodore on what a good Christian he was. June 24th, he left Honolulu for Monterey. Okay, now we're going to, now he gets into, you know, he thought he was going to miss out on the war. So California was, the Mexico was called Alta California, Upper California, and Baja. So the United States is going to take over Alta California. April 23rd, war is declared against Mexico. Again, the start of the Mexican-American War. July 7th, the Commodore at the time was named Slope. He raises the American flag in Monterey, which was the capital of Alta California at the time. July 15th, Stockton replaces Sloat. July 23rd, Stockton, it's called the Stockton Proclamation. He declares the United States is in possession of California. 1846, uh, August, they take over all the seaports. Uh, up in San Francisco, Monterey, Santa Barbara, all the way down to San Diego. So he, he lands sailors and marines and takes these ports. However, September through October, the Californios, these were the Mexican citizens who lived in California, that was their name, they were called the Californios. They had a revolt and they retook Los Angeles and San Diego. And between December and January 47, Stockton, John C. Fremont, who uh, was involved in General Stephen Kearney, they evict the uh, rebels, and on January 13th, the Treaty of Cayuenga was signed that's outside of LA, and the Alta California is ceded to the United States. A little interesting silence, in effect, with our uh, greenhouse. While the Commodore was doing all this, uh, taking over California, he did a little land deal. He bought a 2,000 acre rancho. Uh, it was called Rancho El Portorero in Santa Clara. Portorero is Spanish for pasture. What happened was the uh, Mexican government started taking all the land away from the missions who they settled in California. And the British minister had bought this rancho in Santa Clara, uh, can, uh, around Santa Clara mission. And Stockton bought it from him for, as it says there, uh, $10,500. And over the years that he owned it, he sent thousands of fruit trees, uh, apples, peaches, things like this. He was the first person to introduce strawberries in California, asparagus. And the thing that I didn't, um, didn't realize, he brought honeybees to California. And Debbie and I were talking about this. Uh, honeybees were not native to North America. The settlers in Jamestown brought the first honeybees to America. By the 1850s, honeybees made it to like the Midwest. So he had to put honeybees on the ship and bring them to California. Uh, a lot of them died, but he had enough to uh, get started. He also hired two botanists, agriculture agronomists, um, 
man named Shelton and another man named Bernard Fox to run his uh, fruit farms in California. And just to give you an idea where we are today, so Santa Clara, where his rancho was, we see Santa Clara, and there's San Jose, and it's up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in 1862, it says he sold the land for $110,000. Uh, he sold it to a man named Charles Palambus, who was running a railroad up along the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, now, the Congress of California, I mentioned the names a little bit about them. So the Commodore, he was commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, and he assumed the role of all U.S. forces, both land and sea, in California, and he named himself Governor of California. <laughs> then he names John C. Fremont to take his place as Governor. Fremont had led a group of men who, they were called the Bear Flag Revolutionaries, they were the first ones uh, in 1846 to rise up against the Mexicans, and then this gentleman here, General Brigadier General Stephen Carney, he was a regular army officer sent out by President Polk. He first took over New Mexico, and then he had orders to go to California and take over uh, California. But he, Kit Carson, everybody even knows the name, the famous frontier. He was carrying a message from Stockton to Washington to tell him they took California. He meets Kearney in uh, New Mexico, and Kearney says, "Oh, okay, good." So. He had 300 sol soldiers with him. He sent 200, he left 200 there. He said, well, I only need 100. And he runs into trouble because of the rough, uh, where they rebelled. But he has an order that he's the head of uh, California, Stockton, and Fremont refused to follow his orders. Both Kearney, Stockton, and Fremont get orders to come back to Washington. So on June 20th, 1847, the Commodore with 49 men decide to make a land crossing back east. So he leaves Los Angeles and basically fought. This is the trail to California, but I'm figuring he took it all the way back when he got to uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. And again, in this book, or this story, the sketch of the Commodore, there's a chapter on his uh, trip across the country where he's fighting Indians and he's on buffalo hunts and it's again another adventure story. Uh, Kearney and Fremont who were army men, they left on their own and when uh, Kearney and Fremont get to, get to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kearney has Fremont arrested for uh, disobeying orders and mutiny, what have you and they hold a court-martial for him in Washington. So the journey from Los Angeles to St. Joseph, Missouri, they got there at the beginning of November, and then using river boats and uh, railroads, he came into Washington on December 1st. So remember, from uh, Norfolk to California, he left in October of 40. Uh, five got there in July of 47. The trip home took almost as much time over land. Now, when the Commodore returns home, people in Washington, the politicians weren't very happy about him. And upon full examination of correspondence of both, I was satisfied that General Carney was right and that the Commodore, of course, was wrong. This was written by Jack, by the President in May of 47. That's why they were told to get home. However, when Stockton, he receives a hero's welcome in New Jersey and Philadelphia. And on December 31st, six to 700 people go to this place in Philadelphia called the Music Fund Hall, where there's a big dinner reception and Stockton gives this big speech and he becomes one of the leading proponents of what was called the All Mexico Movement. You know, they weren't satisfied with taking what they did along the Texas border and California they wanted to take all of Mexico. Remember, they were, that was part of their idea of manifest destiny. destiny. However, the treaty in February, the Treaty of uh, Hildago Guadalupe was signed, which ended the Mexican War, and so the All Mexico Movement ended. The Commodore's next venture into uh, finance was, he decides to go gold mining in Virginia. And he spent the summer of 1748 buying gold mines in Virginia, a couple in North Carolina. 
Again, I really didn't know there were gold mines. You remember when you read about the uh, settlers at Jamestown, that they were out searching for gold and everybody laughed at them, well, hey, there was gold in, in Virginia. As a matter of fact, until the California strike, Virginia supplied the most gold in the United States. And I have up there, the Commodore was almost ready to move to Virginia. Uh, he built a house in Fluvanna County, and I have it there, that's just south of Charlottesville, where the university is. However, in December of 1848, President Polk announces the gold rush, the gold strike in California, and this ended all gold fever in Virginia. All the people who were working the mines in Virginia left and went to California. So this ended the Commodore's gold mining adventure in Virginia. May 28, 1850, the Commodore resigns his commission. Now, these were, some of, these were the offices that he held. He held two offices as a warrant officer. He was a midshipman and a position called the master's mate. Then his commission ranks were Lieutenant, Master Commandant, Captain Commodore, and he resigned in 1850. In the United States Navy at this time, uh, the rank of Master Commandant today would be divided into uh, Lieutenant Commander and Commander. Uh, lieutenancy, was, today you have a Lieutenant Junior Grade and a Lieutenant, and they added Ensign. Uh, the rank of Commodore was a rank that was not a permanent one. Usually a captain who was put in charge of a small fleet or a squadron, he was called a Commodore. And then once his command was over, he was no longer a Commodore. But it was like one of those honorary things. Like once you held it, you were always called it. Like if you were governor of New Jersey, they always call you governor. If you were president, they call you president. So once you were a Commodore, uh, they always called you Commodore. And our picture downstairs, you see on his epaulets, he has a star on each epaulet. So that indicated that he was a Commodore. Now, he moves on into politics. He becomes a senator from the state of New Jersey. Democrat senator, uh, December 30th, 1851. He was the first United States Navy veteran to become elected to the Senate. I didn't know that until I looked at this. And one of the reasons, first, the United States Navy was very small at this time. His one accomplishment was a bill to kill the, to reinduce flogging. You read in a number of books where it said he ended flogging in the Navy. Well, flogging had been outlawed, but there was a bill to bring it back. And so he stopped it from going through. And he also tried to improve promotion in the Navy, uh, but that didn't make it. And eventually promotions were improved in 1862. He served in the Senate on, only until January of 15, or 1853, so he was only in there two years. And he resigned in favor of his once brother-in-law, I said once brother-in-law because his sister who had married John Thompson had died and Thompson had remarried. And when you read about John Thompson, his claim to fame is uh, his record in the United States Senate. He was absent for 57 roll call votes, 57% of all roll call <laughs> votes, he was not there. So Thompson was not a very serious senator. Now, the Senate, uh, Commodore tried to run for the presidency twice. First in the Democrat Party, where this gentleman, Franklin Pierce, got the Democrat nomination in 1852. Then in 1856, he joined the American or Know Nothing Party, where he tried to get the nomination, but he lost out to this gentleman. Anybody know who that is? Millard Fillmore. Millard Fillmore, very good. <laughs> and Millard Fillmore was the nominee, but he lost to James Buchanan. Now, a little bit about party loyalty was not one of his strong suits. <laughs> so he started out as a Federalist. His father was a Federalist. 1824, he supports the John Quincy Adams. The party was called Democrat-Republican. 1828 to 36, he becomes a Jacksonian Democrat. He's angry at John Quincy Adams because he supported Adams because he thought he was going to give his father a federal judgeship in New Jersey, but he didn't. So he goes over to the Jacksonian Democrats and also celebrates Martin Van Buren. 1840, he celebrates or uh, supports Harrison and Tyler in the Whig Party. Why? Because uh, in 1838, two <coughs> junior captains or two junior officers were named captain above him. And so he got mad at uh, 
Van Buren for holding up his captaincy. 1844 48, he supports the Democrat candidates Polk and Cass. And then in 1852, he tried to get the nomination lost out to Pierce. When we talk about losing this American know nothing nomination. 1860, he goes back to the Democrat Party, but he supports John Bell, who was called a constitutional unionist. It was an uh, offshoot of the Democrat Party. And then in 1864, he supported McClellan. Uh, so these were his political backgrounds. 1853, the Commodore buys a 600 acre farm at the Jersey Shore. And here's a picture of his farm at the shore. Uh, this is a glass negative I found online, taken by this person, Marriott Morris, and it's on the uh, Library Company of Philadelphia site. So this was his farm at the shore. Uh, the Commodore and his family and friends spent six weeks at the Jersey Shore. So he summered at the shore every summer until he died in 1866. Now, after he resigned from the Senate, he goes back to being the head of the joint companies, which is now called the United Railroad and Canal Company. Uh, during his tenure, his main job was to battle to preserve the monopoly that they had over railroads in central Jersey. And he was successful fighting them off. And even in the Civil War, the federal government tried to bring in and have another railroad because they said the uh, New Jersey Central was not uh, efficient enough, but he was able to fight them off. And then in this picture of the Commodore, again, it was found on the Bancroft Library Collection. This is in California. Uh, this is the only picture I ever saw him with facial hair. And remember we talked about it, and I went and looked it up, and this is where it came from. So this was a picture of him in 1861. Disasters for the joint companies. Now, if Teflon, remember when John Gotti was on trial, he's called him the Teflon Don. If Teflon was around, he would have been called the Teflon Commodore. <laughs> because we went through a whole bunch of things there. He, that happened, but he was never held responsible. Here are two more things. August 29th, near Burlington, New Jersey, the railroad crashes, uh, and 28 or 24 people died, 90 were injured. In March of 1856, uh, they owned the uh, ferries that brought people from Philadelphia to Camden and get on the railroad. The ferry burned, 60 people died on this burning of the ferry. And Stockton is accused of calumnious for he refused to compensate any victims, the families, the survivors. He said, it's not my job. And they, these cases ended up in court. And again, the company and he was not held responsible. His last foray into politics, Washington Peace Conference, February, uh, all of February 1864, basically. They met at the Willard Hotel in Washington. There were 131 delegates from 21 states, 14 free states, seven slave states. Remember, in the Union at this time, there were 33 states. So Confederate states, seven states had already seceded. Uh, five free states did not send delegates. And what were these people for? Well. Stockton was one of nine delegates from New Jersey, and he gives a very impassioned speech calling for preserving the Union at any cost, basically uh, preserve slavery to preserve the Union. And the last couple days of the convention, they came up with a seven-part amendment to the Constitution. It would have been the 13th Amendment, where basically it was the Missouri Compromise of 1820, where slavery could not ex go above the uh, southern boundary of uh, Missouri that parts of uh, what would be New Mexico and Nevada would be eligible to have slavery, whereas California and Oregon were admitted as non-slave states. But the United States Congress itself and the emerging Confederate states, they just rejected these out of hand, that they were not going to have anything to do with it. April of 1862, Harry and Marie dies. If you go to the Princeton Presbyterian Cemetery, section E2, where all the stock and graves are, you'll find uh, Harry and Marie's grave. The Civil War. Sometimes when I give a t uh, my presentation, people ask, when they look at the comment, what did he do in the Civil War? Well, 
He's not recalled back to active service. Uh, but when Lee threatened the invasion of the North in June of 1863, Governor Parker, Joel Parker, was governor of New Jersey, he appoints the Commodore a major general in the, in the New Jersey militia. But once the crisis was averted, Union victor at Gettysburg, he returned to civilian status. A little side note, a fellow midshipman from the War of 1812 was the first American naval officer to obtain the rank of admiral. So up until the Civil War, there was no admiral in the United States Navy because admirals were ahead of big fleets. You know, the United States Navy uh, in the 30s, 40s had maybe 24 ships altogether. Anybody know who that is? He's the first admiral in the United States Navy. David Farragut. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say he was a fellow midshipman, remember uh, the Commodore at 15, 16 became a midshipman. Farragut became a midshipman during the War of 1812 when he was nine years old. So he was a nine-year-old midshipman. So he was the first admiral in the United States Navy. Commodore dies October 7th, 1866. Uh, he left his place in Seagirt, came back to Princeton for a wedding. He came down with cholera morbus, or today we call it acute gastroenteritis. Remember all those Irishmen building his canal to die of cholera? So he ended up dying of cholera. If you go to the uh, cemetery in Princeton, this is his gravesite. I'm assuming it's his gravesite because this is Harriet's. Now I spent about 20, 30 minutes trying to find his name on one of these things. It's not, but I'm assuming because it's next to Harriet's that it was his. And so that is his grave. Okay, now, this was his obituary from the New York Times on October 9th. And we see it talks about him, and the title for the talk came from his obituary. As they said, put him where you would, he was above all a jersey. And again, this is one of our pictures of Stockton from the collection. All right, his legacy. Stockton, California, located in Central Valley, it was named after him. And if you go on the website, it says it was the first town in California not to have a Spanish or Indian name. Stockton, Missouri, located in the foothills of the Arctic Ozarks. <laughs> now, originally was called the Fremont. In 1857, it was renamed Stockton. I'm assuming John Fremont ran in 1856 uh, as the Republican candidate for presidency. Remember, Republicans were ending slavery. Uh, Missouri was a slave state. So I guess they got mad at Fremont <laughs> renamed their town Stockton. Stockton, New Jersey, north of Lambertville, was originally called the Reading Ferry, but with the coming of the Belvedere Delaware Railroad, they changed the name to Stockton in 1853. If you go to Philadelphia, Stockton owned two houses in Philadelphia. The first was down at uh, basically Fourth and Walnut. He owned it from 42 to 57. Then he moved up further north. Uh, around where Broad Street comes. Now, I have a question mark because I found these addresses. There's a online, it's called the uh, City Directory of Philadelphia. And after 1860, his name isn't listed, but we know Harriet died in Philadelphia and stuff like this. So I don't know why his name wasn't there. The interesting thing, where his house was at 1387 Walnut, is a Holiday Inn Express today. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the Commodore is remembered at the Jersey Shore. This is the Stockton Hotel in Cape May. It was built by the West Jersey Railroad, which was a subsidiary of the Camden Amboy Railroad. They ran lines to the shore in 1869. And it was raised in, 18, in 1910, supposedly to put a new structure, but they never built one because it, start, it was losing a lot of money. The other one in Seagart, New Jersey, this was the Stockton Hotel in Seagirt. This hotel converted part of his house. Remember the pictures we saw? It was destroyed by a fire in 1996. Okay, remember our beginning of the specific goals, aims of our talk. Question of slavery. Never believed slavery was morally wrong. If you read his articles and speeches about slavery, he felt God made slavery and there was nothing wrong with it. And uh, 
he, as we saw, he had no fixed political party. What was best for him, that was the party that was important. Manifest destiny, naval expansion, believed the United States should rule all of North America, as we talked, as I mentioned, about the All America, and he believed that the Navy had to expand to protect it. Technological scientific innovations, used the most scientific technology, science technology in his private and public friends. Remember, I talked about adopting the screw propeller, the steam engine below deck, uh, consulting experts in the field of agriculture in his rancho in California and uh, his sugar plantation. And the growth of capitalism, business should be allowed to maximize profits. So I remember talked about whenever he wanted something, you know, keep his monopolies, not be responsible for disasters, uh, the Commodore was there. Here's a preview coming in December. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be giving a presentation at the Revolutionary War Roundtable on Elias Bukno IV, the first Commissary General of Prisoners. <coughs> he held this position from May until July for a year. So that, that's the thing I'm working on now. So that's basically my talk. Look at that, an hour. Uh, in your handout, if you want to go quickly through the handout, if people still have time, we have the picture of the Commodore. The second page is a little biography of the Commodore. The next page is a story of the um, American Colonization Society. I don't know if we can bring a little more light. We can take a look. So uh, the American Colonization Society, as you see, was started in December of 1816 by Reverend Robert Finley. He was the headmaster of the school in Basking Ridge that threw Robert out. But he became the head of the first, he started the uh, society. It was overwhelmingly white, and it originally included abolitionists as well as slave owners. And it was generally agreed with the prevailing view that free blacks could not be integrated into white America. And some of the prominent members over time, as I said, Robert Finley, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, Francis Scott Key, uh, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, who was a slave owner from Maryland, Bushrod Washington. I didn't realize George had an nephew named Bushrod. Uh, and he was the first president. So Finley started it, but uh, Washington's nephew was the first president. And uh, R. Stockton became the first president of the New Jersey chapter. So you had the national organization, but they also had each state had a chapter. Now, why did it come into existence? As it said, they frequently argued that free blacks would be unable to assimilate. Also, this was an interesting thing. This, the Commodore in the sketch of his life talks about this, where he felt the only way you could civilize Africa was to send back uh, free slaves from America who had contact with uh, white society and Christianity, they were able, they were going to be able to go back to Africa and civilize uh, the Africans on the continent. Uh, and if you read about the British Empire and things, this was usually referred to as the white man's burden, that it was his job to civilize the Indians in India, the Africans in Africa, what have you. However, by the 1830s, black and white abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, they began to question the intent of the ACS, claiming its true purpose was to drain off uh, most, most of the educated free blacks population, and these were the people who challenged slavery, and by sending them out of the country, nobody would challenge slavery. And what was the result? Three reasons why it never became successful. The lack of interest of free blacks, and by 1830s it said opposition by uh, abolitionists. The scale and cost of transporting so many people to Africa was impossible. Remember, at the end of the Civil War, uh, there were four million free freedmen living in the South alone. How were you going to transport these many people? And the other thing was, where are you going to put them? The people who lived in Africa were not with open arms were going to take, you know, Liberia was started, but it took uh, a great deal of finagling to get it. The British were the first ones to start this movement. The country of Sierra Leone, 
was originally a, the British started their, where they transported freed slaves uh, to Africa. And uh, that country is just north of Liberia. And uh, after the notion of transporting former slaves back to Africa was no longer feasible, the society continued in existence. It did not formally dissolve until 1964. What they did then, they switched their emphasis and sent money aid to Liberia. So they were a source of aid. The next page, I went to the United States Census. Uh, if you go online at Ancestry.com, you have to do it in the library. I don't have an Ancestry.com uh, account, but you can go to the library and do this. It's interesting that the Commodore is in the 19, 1830 census for two places. His plantation in Georgia and Princeton. So we see his plantation in Georgia. There was one free, or white free male, one. White free female, one between the ages of 30 and 39, and two, 10 to 14. So that's Harriet and two of her daughters. The slave population, male, and I break it down by age. So 27 below the age of 10, 21, 21, and four. Female slaves, 12 below 10, what have you. So on his plantation in Georgia, there were four whites and 108 slaves. His Princeton house, remember, he's still living in Palmer House. There was one free, uh, white free male, 130 to 39, that was him. 20 to 29, I don't know who that was, might have been his brother-in-law. Uh, and then two of his sons. The females, there were Harriet, 20 to 29, and I guess they were the daughters. There was one free colored male between the ages of 36 and 54. They still had three slaves, one male and two female. So totally in Princeton in 1830, there were eight whites, one free colored, and three slaves for a total of 12. We jump ahead to 1840. There were three white males between the ages of 40 and 49, uh, two, 30 and what have you, the females, you see that? Now, there were three colored males. One who was between the ages of 55 and 99, and then two, 24 to 35. Three colored females, one and two. So total, 15 white uh, males. Okay, that, the five agricultural workers, so these were what, white males who were not part of the family, they worked on the farm and he had five free colored. So there, in 1840, you know, slavery had ended in New Jersey by this time. Now, in 1850, they actually named the people. So these earlier census, they just gave you numbers. Mm -hmm. 1850, they started to name who lived there. So we had Robert, 53, Richard, 25, and Robert, Jr., 18. So John Potter, the other son, was not living in Princeton at the time. The females who lived here, Harriet, the daughters, well, Kate was Catherine, Mary, Harriet, Julia, Caroline, and Annex. And at this time, they had four Irish serving women who were the servants on the property. And their names, uh, J. Davis, M. Hoy, Sherritt, and Patterson, so, and they're, they're ages. So you had three males, seven female family, and four servants for a total of 14. I tried to get the 1860, but it wasn't online where I was working. Mm -hmm. And then the last page, oh, not the last page. If you took the West Jersey Railroad and you wanted to go to the Stockton Hotel in Cape May, here was their advertisement. Mm -hmm. So they advertised in those days. So Charles Duffy was the manager. Uh, again, it says 1881. So remember, the Commodore's dead by the, well, the hotel was built after he died. It was greatly enlarged, improved rooms. There's a new restaurant, a new billiard room, bowling alley, passenger elevator, electric bells, and they could accommodate a thousand guests. Music by Simon Hassler's celebrated orchestra. Opens June 25th, 1881. And they even named, here you are, uh, room clerk, Harry Dennison of the late Gerard Philadelphia. So he was the clerk at the Gerard. <laughs> The last page I include is somewhat of a candidate of bibliography. There are very few books on the Commodore. 
the only book, a thick book who is on his biography is the first one, uh, R. John Brockman's Commodore, The Protein Man for a Protein Nation in 2009. Now, uh, when I first started coming here and got interested in the Commodore, Beth had this book because I went online. It was $134. I figured the guy was a college professor, wrote the book and made his students buy it. <laughs> so I borrowed bets again when I was preparing this, but I went on Amazon again to check, and again it was like 120, it was over $100. A week later I get an email from Amazon, if you want the book you can have it for $25. So that's why I said, so if you're interested in this book, go online to Amazon and wait and hold out. Uh, another book, James Bradford, Quarterdeck and Bridge, Two Centuries of American Naval Leaders. And the chapter five written by this Harold Langley, Robert Stockton, Naval Officer and Reformer, and it's Annapolis Press. And it's a fairly good chapter on the Commodore, and the entire book, if you're interested in the history of the United States Navy, it has biographies starting with the American Revolution to the, uh, so through the 1890s. Now, the one thing I kept mentioning, the sketch of the life of Commodore Robert F. Stockton, written by Samuel John Bayer and Robert F. Stockton. This was basically a panegyric that for him that he and Bayer wrote in 1856 when he's gonna run for president. So this is, everything about in this book is, uh, you know, and he's in the most favorable light, but there's very interesting chapters, like the chapter about him crossing um, the United States when he left California. Uh, and the other interesting thing is, as parts of the book and appendix are a number of his speeches and letters and in there is the sermon that he gave in Hawaii where the king of King Kamehameha III was so enthralled with this great Christian what have you so it serves as a primary source of a number of letters and speeches if you're interested in the history of the Mexican American War in California there's a site called uh, the military <laughs> museum it's run by the California Military Museum. And it, it, when you click to their thing on the Mexican-American War, there's a number of articles going like from the ni late 1900s to present day about the war in California. And it talks about the Commodore, a number of them. Another important online source on the Commodore is Hathi Trust. This is a site that has uh, a lot of historical documents and if you go to their website, type the catalog, you type in Robert F. Stockton, at least seven or eight different uh, speeches of his come up. If you're into old time TV, and I remember watching this when I was a kid, you go to YouTube, you type in Death Valley Days, mm -hmm. season 14, episode 22, 1965, and it brings up the episode called The Firebrand. And it was mainly about the two Two Mexicans who, one was the governor of, of the Monterey, the other was governor down in Los Angeles, and they were fighting against each other as much as they were Americans. But they do deal with the Commodore. There's a couple scenes where they're dealing with the Commodore, and the Commodore comes off as a very magnanimous winner in this. And I guess if you know, Robert Ray, uh, Ronald Reagan was the host of uh, Death Valley Days. If you're interested in his house in Seeger, Joe Bilby, Seagirt in New Jersey, uh, a brief history. The Cape, the Stockton Hotel in Cape May. Uh, Salvini's Summer by the Sea is very interesting. And for the canal, uh, the two that I found interesting were McKelvey's Delaware Raritan Canal and uh, Elizabeth Menzies. These are Acadia Press's uh, more popular version. So again, if you're interested in the Commodore, I hope some of this uh, get you interested in his work. And now, like I said, people have to go. You're welcome. If anybody has questions, you want to go over things. Uh, before we go into one thing, remember when you start off as a midshipman, do you know where the term midshipman came from? In the, in the Navy and in the, any service on the water, the enlisted men or the ratings, they lived in the front of the ship. It was called the foxhole. The officers lived at the stern of the ship. The young men who were learning to be officers and like the surgeon, the people who weren't officers and they weren't enlisted men, they lived in the middle of the ship. So that's why they were called the midshipmen. So that's where that term came from.
So the enlisted men lived in the front, the officers lived in the back, and the uh, nine officers, nine enlisted men lived in the middle of the ship. Bravo, Joe. Thank you. Any questions, comments, anything about the American Colonization Society, uh, about the railroad, the canal, whatever? And my question is about how much time did he spend here in Princeton, and how much time did he spend, spend managing the DR Canal? Well, between 1830, 1838, he lived in, he was running the canal. 1838 to the end of the Mexican, he wasn't running, the canal was taken over by other family members. Uh, and then when he retired from the Senate in 1853, that's when he went back to being the president and running the canal. So he spent long periods of time when he was in the Navy, not on active duty, running the canal. And then uh, in 1838, when he was named captain and he got orders to get to the Mediterranean, the board of directors of the canal wrote letters to politicians, ah, don't let him go, you know, extend his furlough. But once he got to the Mediterranean, he was on the Ohio for like a maybe less than a month before he got orders go to England and you know that's where he ends up meeting John Erickson. Did I understand right? Is he an unmarked grave? No. I, yes. I showed you the grave. It's, 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 it's probably worn out. It wasn't unmarked though. I mean not purposely. Right, not purposely, but... No, like I said, what, what I think it is, like, I showed you the picture of Harriet's grave, and it's on yes. the side, this is Harriet. Mm -hmm. the, the two graves next to him are, like, so close, like, I couldn't get in there even to see. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming his name is probably there, yeah, or it wore out, but, like I said, I'm assuming that one next to him is... Yeah, his, someone with such a big ego. Right, yeah, and big remember, yeah. this section of the cemetery is E12, or... E2. E2. And all of the Stocktons from the Duke on are buried there. Like uh, Sarah Mark Stockton, she's buried there. They have a plaque for Horatio Stockton, this younger brother who died in the Mediterranean. I don't know if they brought his body back or they just put the plaque up for him. But you'll see all the Stocktons uh, in this section of the cemetery. It's called E2. It's Witherspoon Street and it's close to the end there. Any and other? His office when he was working on the canal is right at the end of Alexander Street, that stone building. It's now sort of surrounded by Trinity Church. And the other thing I, read, I don't know if I read it in my book or what, but when he was living here and he was doing his work, the library, he kind of lived in that part of the house that he had his living up, upstairs and he'd come down in his library. So we always talk about he added that part of the house. And uh, Harriet died in Philadelphia. And then she was brought from Philadelphia back here for a funeral. In, uh, was she living in Philly? Or just yeah, remember, the, their main house was in Philly. This was right, this 150 acre Philly. working farm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, their main property. And like I said, he's, they spent six months at the Jersey Shore. Mm -hmm. Harriet didn't like it. She was afraid that water was going to come and wash her out to sea. Mm -hmm. But the commoner built a big deck on the back <laughs> of the house. Like the, the picture that I had of that, the house, uh -huh. that was the side that faced inland. The other part was the, where the ocean was back there. But the commander put a deck so he can walk around feel like he was back at sea. <laughs> and it said before they bought the house at Seagirt, they used to spend the summer at Long Branch, which has the reputation of being the summer home of the presidents. Like they have a place to seven, the house of the seven presidents. So the Stockton and somebody told him there's this big piece of property down the coast uh, for sale. And then after he died, a uh, different group of guys bought that property, and that's when they broke it up into five-acre lots. When they, they finally extended the railroad from uh, Freehold there, so people used to start coming ashore. Because when the Commodore went there, they, they describe it in this book about Seeger, they would get as far on the train to Freehold, then they would have to load all these wagons up with their stuff, and then take wagons up to uh, cross the sand to uh, get to Seeger. Any other questions? I want to say thank you so much to Dr. Joe.
this for us, you know, as a labor of love, and he really he outdid himself with this, and he spent a lot of time at some. And I have no, no one that I did a few months back on Richard Stockton. Richard Stockton. That I'm going to re-edit in your format. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pictures, sure, less sure. talk. Yeah. 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 Less writing. Wonderful, really wonderful. And just as I mentioned earlier, if you do want to go see the um, exhibition related to the Commodore's Greenhouse, I don't know when he had time to work or even see his greenhouse because he was always traveling during that yes. period of time if you can see and compare the time of what we learned today. But um, I've been asked to remind you if you do want to go see, no photos allowed. However, we encourage you to go see. So thank you again, Dr. Thank you. Joe. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for so coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they called it. But that was the field when it wasn't good. Right, so the Bordentown went in. The other thing I read was seven locks on the canal. Okay. Did you enjoy it?